This is the Ted Walshin Podcast. Brought to you by Helenda's The Meat People. Enjoy their award-winning products at selected Metro, Sobeys, Fortinos, and Foodland locations. Helenda's The Way Sausage Should Taste. And Tom's Place. For the finest in men's clothing at unbeatable prices, it's Tom's Place at 190 Baldwin in the heart of Kensington Market. Tom's Place will suit you. And now, here's Ted Wallachin. Thank you so much, and welcome to another episode of the Ted Walsh Podcast. I am he, and you are you, and we appreciate you joining us if it's your first time. Uh, thanks very much for coming aboard, and if you've been with us from the past, uh, thanks very much for sticking with us and introducing us to your friends. And don't forget, you can follow us and download us uh, each week. We have a brand new episode comes at you sometime between midnight Wednesday and when the birds and bees first wake up on Thursday mornings. And uh, feel free to comment and send us your thoughts. Uh, you can do so uh, in a number of different fashions. You can follow me on Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter at Ted Wallachin, W-O-L-O-S-H-Y-N. This week, Toronto-born athlete Andrea Constant. You might remember that name. She fought a nearly two-decade legal battle against comedian Bill Cosby after she alleged that he drugged and sexually assaulted her. She penned a memoir titled The Moment, Standing Up to Bill Cosby, Speaking Up for Women. And that has become the inspiration for an upcoming CBC documentary set to air on CBC TV Sunday, January 8th, titled The Case Against Cosby. It'll be available on their streaming service, GEM, after its initial airing. This is Bill Cosby's house. This is the driveway I drove in. Here's where I parked my car. This is where I walked into the kitchen entrance on the back. And this is the room that he took me to right here. It's producer and director, executive producer and director, technically, is Karen Wookie, who is a veteran who has been nominated for Gemini, Canadian Screen, and Daytime Emmy Awards. Please welcome Karen Wookie. Thanks very much, Karen, for joining us. I, I appreciate this very much. I, I've got to tell you, um, it's it's a riveting piece. It's I, I couldn't stop I couldn't stop watching it. And I mean, I, I was privileged to have the opportunity to see it an advance an advanced screening. And I thought, well, I'll watch a little bit now, and then I'll watch a little bit after dinner. My dinner sat cold. I could not I could not pull <laughs> myself away from the computer. And, and there are times where I had to withhold myself from throwing my phone against the computer because I was so pissed off at what I was watching it has it has that kind of an effect and I can just imagine what what thank you the kind of emotions that it would evoke in somebody who has gone through this type of a situation I can't imagine that this is what I should say but nevertheless let's 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 talk about mm-hmm. the case against Cosby here tell me the the idea behind this was it was it based on the writings from from Andrea or was it yeah it happened quite organically. Um, I've known Andrea for a number of years, a long time actually, and we had lost touch, but she, I have a, we're in the country close to each other. And she told me she'd written a book and uh, I read the book and read it in a couple of nights and called my business partner and said, we need the rights to this book because this is, I need to tell the story. And the book is called The, the Moment, right? Yes, standing up, uh, standing up to cause, uh, cause. I can't remember. Uh, it's called the moment, but it's her story. Uh, although I really felt it needed to go further. It's such a difficult story to tell because it's so upsetting um, that I wanted to find also a story of hope. And I also had personal experience. This happened in my family. My sister was kidnapped uh, for a week in the 60s and uh, raped. And there was a huge trial. And of course, he was acquitted and it destroyed my family. So I had seen what this happens to Pete. She did not survive. She's alive, but she didn't survive. So I had seen the collateral damage of the secrecy and what happens to people. And I've been in the room many times when parents will say, why can't you just get over it? Or friends will say. So I really wanted to show what happens to a person over time when this happens, what happens to the people who love them 
and why we don't understand what, how to deal with it or how to make space for it or how to help them heal. And more importantly, how our culture enables it to stay secret and do the damage that it does. Yeah. And, and although the, the documentary focuses on, um, on the trials and tribulations of Andrea Kostad, most of the documentary at least, there are other experiences that are shared during this program. And in fact, in total, there were something like 60 victims who have come forward yes. to date, right? Yes, that, more than 60. That, that stunned me. I, I, I didn't realize that it was any, anywhere that high. Cause I remember when the story first broke and, and it kept growing and growing. And of course, this, this took place over so many years. Mm-hmm. It was like a never-ending sort of bad soap opera. And I never really stopped to count, but I never thought it was that many people. Mm -hmm. Well, what's interesting is in that why this was the perfect story to tell this story is, first of all, Andrea is an extraordinary survivor. Yeah. Uh, She had the strength to go the distance and, uh, you know, it took 15, 17 years of her life to do that. But also Cosby had fooled the world for decades. This has been going on for five, six decades, which is not uncommon because perpetrators don't just stop. And he had managed to keep the women silent and to keep the stories out of the paper and people weren't believing them. So it was the perfect story in the unfolding of how it came to be culturally a time when people were ready to listen. And also after 60 survivors, at some point where there's smoke, there's fire. Yeah. Now, do you think that so many people were in denial when when it came to uh, uh, Cosby's guilt because they didn't want to or they couldn't believe it? Nobody wants to believe it. And this is what, you know, the thing is, we expect we expect this type of perpetrator to come out of the bushes carrying an axe and they don't there are un- they look like our uncles and our brothers and our fathers or priests or people we trust so no one a wanted to believe it number 2 he was you know he was an icon of american culture so it was easy to uh, discredit the women as they came up one by one and that's what he did he's there were multiple dozens and dozens of ndas where he paid these women off and they disappeared into the woodwork Mm-hmm. And every time they would come up, it would just be another crazy woman, woman telling lies to make money or whatever. And let me tell you, no one wants to be famous for being the victim of sexual assault. No, no one. And, so, and, and, and I think, I think it, uh, at, one, at one point, uh, Andrew was, was, was referred to as a gold digger. A- yeah. and, and that was never her intent. It no. was a, never a financial thing. And she wanted him in jail. In fact, the interesting thing, the woman in the film who I adore, the two specialists who are both women, both uh, probably world specialists on predators and predator behavior. Um, One is Ann Burgess and the other one, Anna Salter. And Ann Burgess had been brought into Andrea's case when it was a civil trial to determine what the um, remuneration should be. And at that point, they they were just basically seeking damages. She just wanted him accountable and she wanted to be heard her voice and it was that woman who spent two days i believe with andrea who determined what the settlement should be and it was 3.3 million yeah so the story begins with andrea going to the uh, university um in in arizona Mm -hmm. she's she's a a gifted athlete Mm -hmm. from from after her graduation she gets offered a job at temple university as director of baseball operations, a temple basketball. in basketball Univers- or basketball, basketball, I should say. Operations. She had actually, she had actually, by that time, played for Greece or for Italy. Sorry, she played internationally for mm-hmm. Italy. And to, so, so she, Temple University, which is Bill Cosby School. Yeah, Co- Cosby is a booster, which means yeah. a lot of things, uh, and mm-hmm. he's honored, revered, or was at least at one point there. And he approaches her in the manner that he approached so many women over the years. And he's referred to as a groomer. And he did this not only with athletes, but with actors, actresses, mm-hmm. models. And he comes to her and he says, you know, I think that you've really got potential for a career in, in broadcasting, in sports broadcasting. Mm-hmm. And at this point, she has no reason whatsoever to believe that he is not being honest mm-hmm. and altruistic. Mm-hmm. And she herself had no, 
she had no interest in sports broadcasting. He kind of in his grooming, and that's what he did with all of them. I can help you. I can get you headshots. I can do this. I can do that. Mm-hmm. Um, and it took, I think she, it, it took about a year before he actually assaulted her. But at that point, she had no reason not to trust him. She'd been to his home a couple, a few times. He was introducing her to people. He was showing, you know, he, he even a lot of the women he called, you know, he called their mom, mother's mom. Yeah. That was one of his standard things. Start a relationship with the parents, get the parents to trust him, refer to them as mom and dad. Uh, he often referred to us himself as dad when the women were very young, and a lot of them were. So that was all sort of the, that's kind of his M.O. Well, that was an easy sell for him when you think about it, because he was considered by, by so many, by millions and millions of people as, as, as a father figure. He, yeah. was, like, he was like America's yeah. dad. And, yeah. and more so on, on his program, Cosby, where he played the father of four or five children, you know, successful doctor married to a lawyer. I mean, he was just the perfect, but it's like everybody wanted to have a father like that with a great sense of humor and smart and good looking and athletic and the whole deal. I mean, he, he was the whole package. Well, here's something you may not know. I didn't realize this till making the film that he actually played an OBGYN on that show and his office was in the basement of his house. Yeah. How creepy is that? That is very creepy. Hiding in plain sight. Yeah. Um, but yes, he had created, and they will tell you that that generally with, um, with predators like this, and it's, it is a psychopathic trait, the first thing they will do is create a persona of someone that you would never believe capable of such thing. Think of priests, yeah. thinking of, think of hockey coaches, think of yeah. teachers, think of, they will create a persona so that no matter what they hear from children or from victims, you're not going to believe it of that person. So yeah. that's what he did very successfully on a global scale. Yeah. Probably would have been easier to to believe that he was guilty at the outset if he was an actor who played heinous characters. Yeah. You know, if he was kind of one of those creepy actors and you think, well, yeah, that, that guy looks like he could be that way. But he yeah. never... This is Mr. Jello, you know. I mean, it's a, yeah. How, how much more family can you get? But so let's go back to when when the first encounter happened, the first sexual encounter when when he drugged Andrea. I basically got out of there just as fast as I could, with my humiliation, with my shame, and the Andrea that walked in that door that night was not the Andrea that walked out the door. That was the one and only encounter. Um, And she, I mean, she tells her own story in the film. But, um, you know, the first thing, I I know Andrea, Andrea, like me, I don't even take aspirin for a headache, and she's like that, and he knew she was like that, so he told her they were homeopathic, and, you know, she was under a lot of stress, deciding whether to leave the job at Temple and go home, and went over for advice just to talk to him, which, you know, was not unusual because he'd sort of taken on that role in her life. And so when he said, well, take these, they'll, you know, they're, they're, they will help you relax. She didn't think twice. None of the women did, by the way. Yeah. Like he did it, he did it with that count, probably 50, probably more, because if 60 came forward, it's more likely there's triple that amount. Yeah. But that that was his thing was he he would medicate them with something for their nerves for this for that and or put it in their drink and within a very short period of time they be, would become completely immobilized. At this point she's how old? I think she, she was one of the she was older than a lot of the victims. She was 29 at the time, I believe. Mhm. Because there were some of the victims that he started on them when they were like 15, 16 yeah. years of age. Yeah. Which is something that I didn't realize either. I mean, I, I always thought that they, they were adults, or at least closing in on adulthood. But well, I mean, one of the one of the women in the film, Renita, who uh, I was really, you know, we interviewed a lot of the survivors to find the five or the four that were going to come together for the retreat. And yeah. Renita, Renita's, their stories are all very different. And I really felt that someone in the, the audience was going to relate to at least one of them, if not all of them. But Renita... She had been 15, but he he assaulted her multiple times over four years, drugging her every time. So she couldn't 
remember what happened, but she knew something was wrong. She doesn't drink alcohol in her own. So her final visit to him, she finally got away from him. He had totally inveigled her family and her parents into controlling her. And when she finally said, you know, I, I'll come visit you, but I don't want to drink anymore. He literally went, well, then you can't come. And that was the end yeah. of the relationship. So that was four years. And as Dr. Uh, Dr. Gabor Mate in the film explains, there's many types of memory. And just because you can't consciously recall what happened, your body knows. So the trauma plays out in your life in major ways. You just can't recall the details of what happened. Ted Wallachin returns in a moment. Our Boxing Day sale is here, and it suits us perfectly. Hey, it's Ted Wallison for Tom's Place, and we love offering incredible deals. We're open for business, and more importantly, on sale. Check out our website, toms-place.com, for details about our specials and ours. We have no supply chain issues. We are fully stocked. In fact, we have huge amounts of inventory that we want to move. And the deals are simply amazing. Prices lower than ever in the 60-plus history of Tom's Place. Shirts, sweaters, coats, sports jackets, suits, and more priced to be given away to you. And we've got gift certificates as well. Tom's Place Boxing Week sales on now, Kensington Market. So now, more than ever, you know it's important to shop local. Thank you for your support. Tom's Place, the Boxing Week sale, will suit you. Have you been tasked with the role of a state executor or expected maybe in the future you will be? Well, if so, let me make your life a lot simpler by introducing you to my friend Debbie Stanley. Debbie is the founder of ETP Canada. They specialize in estate administration. Their goal simply is to help Canadian executors understand their role and how to deal with the loved one's estate. Let's face it, there's no school for this. But ETP Canada offers services such as executor support, estate accounting, and they have a new online course called Executor Ready. It's an engaging video designed to make estate administration easier and affordable. And those are two comforting thoughts during a stressful time. So call Debbie Stanley at one 866 309-0387, that's 1-866-309-0387, or you can get her at info at etpcanada.ca, that's info at etpcanada.ca. He's a serial rapist, actually. He sexually assaulted me. Secretly drugged me. Made me have oral sex with him. In my room. In my own bed, in my own home. He had given me wine and a pill. The last things I remember is just feeling the strokes on my head. The first time I realized he was assaulting women, I think, was Barbara. Barbara Bowman wrote an op-ed. I would wake up completely confused, half-dressed, and knowing that my body had been touched without my permission. And it's not necessarily that people thought he was guilty. It wasn't their perspective of Cosby that began to shift. But the narrative began to shift, and now these young women were being heard. Karen Wookie is my guest. She's executive producer of the documentary The Case Against Cosby, which airs on CBC on January 8th. Donna is another woman who is uh, featured in the documentary who began a sexual relationship with Bill Cosby when she was 16 and he was 42, and it went on for six years. Yeah, her story was important, I felt, because, um, well, as much as something can be consensual at that age, she was, first of all, she's triumphed over her. It destroyed her life. She was an A student. She had been, uh, she had had another predator. Her friend's father had assaulted her just before Cosby. Then she went to Cosby. He carried on that, like he would take her on business trips on his private plane. She was 16. He was 42. He would bring her to business meetings. He would take her and her family away. He'd put her family up. Um, and she was quite destroyed by that and became a severe addict for a number of years and then found sobriety, healed herself, and now works mm -hmm. helping other women. She then went on to become, she's been on more Playboy covers than any other playmate. She, was, she became a Playboy playmate. So she mm -hmm. became hypersexualized at a very young age. And it played out in her life in a very destructive way. But the extraordinary thing about her is she found her way out. She found her way to sobriety. 
And she now helps other women um, struggling with the same things that she was struggling with. But yes, he kept that relationship going for six years. And it was probably one of many. How much of this this information do you think Cosby's wife knew about? Well, that's the big question, isn't it? And we've had many discussions over that. And I really thought long and hard about whether to include that in the film or not. I felt it wasn't relevant because we couldn't. Um, we couldn't, you could only speculate. Um, but I can tell you that a lot of the women were paid off because, uh, I believe she runs the accounts for everything and they have a foundation together. And a lot of the women were paid off out of that foundation. So she would have signed those checks, what she knew and what she didn't know. I can't say. So when Andrea first goes to the authorities and says, this is what happens, how do they react? Uh, you know, at first, she she sat on it for a year, as you know from the film, which nearly just... I remember running into her in that year, and I knew something had happened. I knew something was very, very different. She was not herself at all. So when she finally spoke up to her mother, her brother, who was a policeman, said, you have to go to the police right away. So she went to the police up here, who then sent um, her to the police in the county where Cosby lives, and she did a full report. They, they paid attention, but, um, the DA, the sitting DA at the time, and there's lots of speculation about why this happened, but he looked at all the evidence. The detective believed there was enough evidence to get a guilty conviction and, uh, take it seriously. But the DA, um, decided not to prosecute him, the first DA. So she was then left without any choice, but a civil trial, a civil case not a civil trial, a civil case. So she then launched a civil case against him because that was her only option. She really wanted him in jail. But the DA at the time, and there was much speculation about the relationship between that DA and Cosby. And in the film, we have one of the prosecutors uh, uncovered a phone call that happened between Cosby and the, and the DA the night before Cosby was going to be interviewed. So that's highly suspicious. Who can say what was said on that call but, um, or speculate? But there, it, it, it was unusual that they decided, not only did they decide not to prosecute him, they never told Andrea. She learned in a press release, <clears throat> which is terrible. Wow. So and then the time between the first trial and the second trial in span is what about ten years? No, no, that that well, yes. the The civil case was in two thousand and six, and then what happened was it's a, it's really a perfect storm of events. Um, there was a comedian, Hannibal Buress, who in ten years later did a stand up um, yeah. did a stand up where he talked about Cosby being a rapist, and that went viral. So the now there's a new day, DA in town in Montgomery County. And everything's coming to light. The world's shifting a bit. And the prosecutor, with two weeks left to go on the statute of limitations on Andrea's case, decided to Mm. prosecute Cosby. And that began an entire cycle. Well, that's what led to the next two trials. And what year was this? Uh, I believe that was 2014 when he was charged. So a few years later, around 2017, the Me Too movement begins, which Mm -hmm. involves a lot of high-profile individuals, Mm -hmm. Harvey Weinstein being one, Kevin Spacey, Matt Lauer from Mm -hmm. the Today Show. How much of an effect did that have on the outcome eventually? Well, you know, there was a change in the temperature, and uh, in the film you can feel the difference between the first and second trial, and the first trial, as we know, ended in a hung jury. And then the Me Too movement, you know, people were starting to come forward. People, everything was hitting the press. So by the time, you know, and when it was a hung jury, she decided right away. Um, she was asked in the green room by uh, the prosecutor, "Did will you will you go through another trial if, if this uh, if we end up with a hung jury?" And right away, she said, "You know, always follow through." She was shooting a basket on a small a ball into a small basket. So yeah. she, they decided to go to trial right away. The world was changing. And, you know, what did that have an effect? Probably, absolutely. By the time the second trial came around, there was way more women had come forward. Women were surrounding and outside the courthouse. She had much, much more support. 
Um, even though they went after her in the second trial, they said it was all about money. There was no money to be gained in that trial. And in the first trial, they proposed that she was a jilted lover. So new, new set of lawyers, new tactic, but the world, and probably, you know, he hired Michael Jackson's lawyer. It was a you know big piece of Hollywood brought into a small blue collar town, didn't go over very well. And at that time, the world was changing. So it did, it did not as well, we know what happened. He, mm -hmm. he, was, he was found guilty. And she starts questioning herself, and, and, and I would imagine that many women do as well, but there's things like, well, why did I do all of this? Yeah. Why, why did I do all these things that are hurting, hurting, hurting my family? Mm -hmm. And, and what, what are my parents, what are my f friends going to think of me? And, and as though she had done something wrong. Well, as you know, most people don't come forward. Most victims don't come forward. And there's a really good reason for that because they know what's going to happen and what's going, and it's very, very, very hard to, well, I'll tell you that Andrea told me this after we finished filming. She said when she began this journey and decided to go forward, she was told by her lawyers that the chance of getting her perpetrator a guilty conviction was 2%. So she, wow. she did everything she did knowing that she had a 98% chance of losing. So at that point that you're talking about, you know, she'd finished, the jury was out. She was waiting. She'd been through hell. Her family had been through hell with her. They stood by her side the whole time. And she had that, you know, pivotal moment of what, why did I do all of this? This has completely taken over her life. She had death threats. Her family had death threats. We don't reveal where she lives for very good reason. Um, and that was an momentous effect on her life and at that point she was questioning why she did it of course once she heard guilty 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 she knew she had done the right thing yeah but but it's got to be hell when you think about not only do you have to go through this but now you're 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 a point because of the the, the court's rulings or a judge's ruling or a da's ruling for that matter you're now piling all this guilt in yourself. It's like you're being punished again. Yeah. You're being punished for being punished. Well, she would say there, there's much to be said. You get re-traumatized in a, in a trial. Yeah. And her trial was on a world stage. She was judged very harshly, as all women are who go through that. But that's why her story is so important, because it all happened on a world stage with uh, a perpetrator everyone knows and considered in a certain way and had to be revealed to be the, the man that he was and what he was up to. So what she goes through, every, every victim goes through when they decide whether to come forward. And that has to change. That has to change. The documentary is called Case Against Cosby, and it airs on CBC on January the 8th. There are two pivotal characters that appear during the course of this documentary, Gloria Allred mm -hmm. being one of them, the attorney and advocate. Talk to me a little bit about her role in all of this. Well, I, you know, originally when we started making the film, we were going to interview Gloria, but in many ways um, the story became about something else. And Gloria... Gloria, although Gloria was never representing Andrea, as, no. as Me Too took hold and as many women came forward, she represented quite a few of the women for the press as it was going forward. And as you know, she took an, a case um, after Andrea, after we were finished filming, there was a case in California um, that went to trial, which they got a guilty conviction on. And that was a victim who was underage at the time of the assault. So because of the underage, uh, there was no statute of limitations. So they went to trial and he was found guilty, although there were punitive damages were minimal. They were half a million dollars, which he saw as a victory, but he did get a guilty conviction. Mm -hmm. and, and the psychiatrist? Um, which the one in our film? And the one in the documentary. Uh, yeah. You're talking about Gabor Mate? The one, the yes, one on the retreat? Yes. Well, Yes. Dr. Gabor Mate, as you know, is like, I mean, one of the world's authorities on trauma and addiction. And I've been a huge fan for many, many years. And when, um, when, we, when I thought of bringing the women together, I tried to think, what could I do with the women so that they could go on a journey and we could understand trauma? So we, <clears throat> I approached Dr. Mate, who I knew, and said, this is what I'd like to do, and it's really only you. I, could, I only see you doing this. 
And at first he had to say no because his book was coming out and he was so busy, but then he liked, you know, he liked the concept so much that he called me back and he said, well, if you can bring everyone here and you can do it in three weeks and I don't have to travel, then I'll do it. So we turned the schedule upside down and two Mm -hmm. of the women didn't have passports. We had to expedite their passports and we brought them together on the Sunshine Coast in this beautiful, magical place for four days and that's what transpired and we put cameras on it and it was really powerful he took them on a really powerful journey that they all it, i would have to say to a woman they transformed together were they hesitant at first to speak openly with him uh they were hesitant you know remarkably when i after i interviewed them and talked to them at length about what what the vision was and what we wanted to do they were all um, you know, they, I think they immediately recognized the potential and the gift of it. And so they all came with, you know, I, they're all, they were all really brave and they came with their hearts wide open and they trusted him from the moment that they met him. There was another woman supporting the work who was really powerful as well. So, um, nope, they gave 150% and they forgot about the cameras within 10 minutes. Yeah. I, I could see that he's he's pretty pretty powerful uh, yeah. uh, personality and and a very very trustworthy as well. Well, his new book, The Myth of Normal, which I've just finished, uh, which I believe is number one in Canada and number five on the New York Times bestseller list, is a phenomenal book. I recommend it to anyone, um, anyone on who's ever dealt with. Well, pretty much you can't say anyone and never has, but it's a fun, it's a it's a big book, but it's fan it's his best book to date. I've read them all. Okay. So 2018, Cosby is, is finally found guilty, and he's sentenced to three to ten years in prison, mm-hmm. uh, which seems minuscule for the crimes that, that he committed. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know if you, I can't, I don't recall whether whether that's discussed um, with standard. Andrea. And that's basically it. Sadly, it's pretty standard. Um, yes, it seems like nothing compared to the crimes he committed, but, you know, as we, as I said before, very, very few perpetrators or sexual assault, um, perpetrators are actually convicted and do jail time. And the sentences are usually quite minimal, but, um, and as you know, it just, just, it seems, it seems so wrong to me that people who commit crimes of fraud, would spend more time in jail than someone who has sexually abused someone else yep. and, and perhaps ruined their mentality, ruined them mentally for the rest of their lives. I don't disagree. I don't disagree, and I think it's time we look at that. But yes, you're right. And then he was let out on a technicality, as you know. And, inter- yeah. and interestingly enough, a month before he was let out, there was a parole hearing for him, and that's we hadn't started shooting yet. But um, I went to Andrea's house when she was she was speaking to the parole board. I shot it on iPhones just to see what was happening. And he was denied parole. He was denied parole because he hadn't done any of the recommendations by the judge. He hadn't gone and done any therapy. And he was he was completely um, adamant that he was Ill, that he was innocent. And they were all lying. He's maintained that from day one. So, do you believe you know that old adage that if you if you repeat a lie often enough, yeah. you begin to believe it? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Do you think that's true in his case? Yes, absolutely. Well, what's interesting is, and in, and in, and in, uh, Anna Salter says it in the film. She explains it that you know they uh, you know perpetrators will not act like a rapist. They will be nice to you. They will confuse you. They will they make you think you're the one who's crazy. And that even though they know they're guilty, they will become incensed that you suggest that they've done this. They'll defend it, you know, to the end. And there's no mm-hmm. explaining the psychology behind that. It's a twist. It, who knows? It could be psychopathy. It could be whatever it is. No one's diagnosed Cosby nor spent the time with him to do so. But that is a standard um, sort of way that that plays out. They defend their innocence knowing they're guilty believe in that that persona that they've created 100 percent even though the, even though he admitted on the phone to her mother and said i'm a bad yeah. man and it took andrea to stop me that that blew me away you know there, there are parallels to be drawn here between 
although one is a murder and the other is a rape, but between this case and, and the O.J. Simpson trial, mm-hmm. because as I was th- it hit me at one point how when uh, one of O.J.'s uh, lawyers, I think it was Kardashian, went to visit him in prison, and he was a good friend of his, and what he couldn't get over was the fact that that, that O.J. kept saying, well, how could people think this of me? How could people yeah. think this of me? Never, never saying I didn't do it. Yeah. He was just so concerned about how could the public think this of me? Yeah. And then I got and and, I, and it, that pop, that flashed through my mind as I was watching the documentary, thinking that kind of same mentality yeah. has got to exist in Cosby's mind. Yeah, exactly. And that's what's fascinating. I mean, when I read the book about uh, Anna Salter's book, she she wrote a book on predators, pedophiles. It was a riveting book. I couldn't read the chapter on sadists. But she, and I said to both of them, you're both women. How did you become the world's leading authority on pedophiles, predators? And both of them had been working with trauma victims. One was from Yale, Harvard, and they were working in their early in their career with trauma. And there was no literature on predators. In fact, Ann Burgess taught the FBI how to profile the character, the mind hunt, or um, I think it's mind hunter is based on her. Because they didn't know or understand how predators' minds worked. So Mm -hmm. between them, they've gone and interviewed. Here's a chilling statistic. She interviewed 350 predators, pedophiles, and between them, they had 21,000 victims. Wow. That's how prolific they are. So, you know, when you start to actually understand how they work, then it's not surprising. Because if you're that, the only reason we don't believe it to be true is because it's so shocking you can't believe it but once you understand how they work how they operate and by the way he's not that special he operates the same way they all do once you understand yeah. that and start thinking like that then it's like oh that's what he's doing it was interesting that that when he was uh, when he was released and from from prison they referred to what he did as improprieties but the court went out of their way to say look he is not innocent. Right. We want to point out the fact that he is not innocent. Mm-hmm. That must have meant so much to Andre and so much to everyone who had been involved in this kind of situation. In this Absolutely. Situation. And in, in many ways, because there were many discussions among the survivors when he was let out, it, it triggered a lot of them were angry and all kinds of things. But Andrea will say to this day, it doesn't matter that he got out because my voice was heard and he was found guilty and he's still guilty. So he's living in a prison of his own. I mean, he can't even leave his house, really. So, And there's another case against him now being brought against him in New York because of the look-back laws. So yeah. it's the story's not over. The thing is, for her, she was heard. Her voice was heard. He was found guilty, so they believed her. And that was, to her, worth the entire journey. You know, I had an interesting conversation with some people after I watched this documentary, and we talked about Cosby, I think, is like 84 years of age now. And somebody said, you know, it's too bad. He said he, he, he should have died 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Yeah. And so one of my other friends said, he says, no, you know, I'm actually glad he didn't. I'm glad he's still alive. Yeah. Because the longer he lives, the more pain he's going to have to go through. That's true. The more he sees his persona crumble. I mean, he still wants to go out on the road. Yeah. He still. Well, did it, he did at one point after one trial, did he not? I know he did radio interviews and there was talk of a comeback trial, but it, or tum, comeback, um, not trial, what's it called? T- comeback tour. To but work. it never yeah. it never happened. But uh, you yeah. know he lives in delusion. So obviously he lives in delusion. He was delusional all the way through. His behavior, you know, proves that. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. It's 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 as I mentioned. It's it's riveting. It, it's a it, you, you need to see this documentary. Everybody needs to see this documentary for, for different reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, not not because of the because of who he is and and how this all played out over the years but how this is more commonplace than you know, Mm -hmm. and that you might know somebody who has been a victim Mm -hmm. who, if they saw this documentary, that might prompt them to come out. Mm -hmm. Do you see that happening? Absolutely. Well, yes, absolutely. In fact, uh, we did a screening with about 150 people, industry people and um, crew and whatnot, and the number of people who called me with their own stories was really, really quite shocking not shocking because i know what the numbers are and how common it is but that was the response um you know was to to tell the story in a way that would leave people with hope and leave people understanding because you know andrea has tattooed on her body tell someone 
Secrets keep families sick, they keep people sick, they keep culture sick, and they keep communities sick. And when you can tell yeah. someone and find the strength to do that, you begin to heal. And that was hopefully made very clear in the documentary so that people watching would learn that if they had had the same, a similar experience. I'm assuming that Andrea has seen the documentary. Oh, yes. Yeah. And what were her thoughts? How did she react? Um, she was very happy with it. She's, uh, you know what, she's, she's an extraordinary woman. And she was very, I watched it actually, we screened it. And then all the women from the film got on, we got on a Zoom call and talked about it for a few hours. So, um, cause I was worried, you know, I didn't want people to be triggered in any way. Anyway, all of the women felt, uh, very fortunate to be a part of it and felt that it, you know, although it, in some ways it, it gave them a couple of days of, you know, f going back there and re yeah. refeeling a lot of things, but they've stayed in touch and Andrea has a healing foundation and they do regular zoom calls. So she has all the tools and they have each other, which is huge finding each other and having each other and doing the work together made all the difference, which is why telling someone is so important. And I wonder if those people who, who were involved in the documentary, those people who were victims, that when their friends who may have doubted them initially mm -hmm. see this, have a better, not only have a better understanding, as, as I mentioned, but might even come forward in, in an apologetic fashion and say, listen, I'm sorry I didn't believe you. Yes, although most of the women eventually found support, although they all suffered extreme hate mail yeah. at, at first. I mean, that was yeah. that was standard. That was pretty common among all of them. Um, and that is it, even I mean, it's not and not just Cosby, just across the board. People they, they say that the average response of a family member when told about abuse, whether it's in the family or outside the family, is to not believe the person telling it. That is the most common response. Well, when you hear that, you, there's, there's no wonder so many women are hesitant to come forward. Well, yes, but that's why, you know, it took one. Andrea was an incredibly brave woman, and, you know, one by one, that is, we're now changing the way we understand trauma and the effects of this kind of trauma and the way we respond. And the only way we're going to change anything is by educating and opening people's minds, which is what we really hope this film will do. I hope people get a chance to watch this documentary. It'll be streaming on CBC after its uh, initial airing on January the 8th. It's called The Case Against Cosby, the executive uh, producer is, has been my guest, Karen Wookie, and I, I thank you so much for taking the time. And, and, my pleasure. And thanks, thanks, thanks for doing this project. And I mean that seriously. Thank you so much. That means a lot. All the best. Okay, thank you. And thanks once again to all for listening. And if you do get a chance, click on the follow button, and the podcast will always be there for you. And also, if you get a chance, go online and fill out your organ and tissue donation card. You could change or even save a life. Have a great week. The Ted Wallish and Podcast has been brought to you by Helenda's The Meat People. Enjoy their award-winning products at selected Metro, Sobeys, Fortino's, and Foodland locations. Helenda's The Way Sausage Should Taste. And Tom's Place. For the finest in men's clothing at unbeatable prices, it's Tom's Place at 190 Baldwin in the heart of Kensington Market. Tom's Place will suit you. The Ted Wallachian Podcast is produced by Joey Roselli. Technical production by Paul Gatt. Music by Bike Thieves. I'm Becky Coles. Submit your questions and comments to ted at twmedia.ca.